Okay, we're at the end of a very challenging chapter that we've got here. And really, this is where lots of things come together. And this is kind of where they like to do some of their exam questions. And we're going to try and solve some geometric problems. Okay, these are going to be problems that don't necessarily feel like they're about complex numbers, but you're going to be able to use complex numbers and all of these patterns that we found to solve them really quickly. So I have got a sketch here of um, the roots, not of unity, but the roots, the six roots of 7 plus 24i. And these have just come from Wolfram Alpha, where you can plot these kinds of things. So you can see I've got one of the solutions here, 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 and here, and here. The thing that's different about the roots of unity is that the modulus for these ones is not equal to 1. And it also doesn't have z1 at 1, which is where they usually are. But for this particular case, it still has got the centre at 0, 0. We're going to do some questions later where they don't have the centre at 0, 0. And I'm going to think about what omega did in the previous questions. Omega, as a bit of a reminder, omega is the first root of unity. It's not going to be z1, which is 1. It's normally the first root, which is the first one that isn't just equal to 1. And the way that we find that is either cos of 2 pi over n plus i sine 2 pi over n, or I usually just think of it as just e to the 2 pi over n i. That's what omega actually is. It has a modulus of 1 and an argument of 2 pi over n. I actually want to think, what did omega do, or what does multiplying by omega actually do to my complex number? Well, let's think about the modulus. First of all, the modulus of omega is 1. So it doesn't change the modulus of the number it's being multiplied by. Because obviously multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything. But its argument is 2 pi over n. So it moves or really rotates the complex number by 2 pi over n radians. In other words, it moves it along to the next corner or vertex of the polygon. So multiplying by w moves it from one complex number to the next complex number. And w is the first root of unity that I've got here. So if I had the first root of unity, let's say I've got, let's say I know what this one is here. If I wanted to move to find out what this next complex number is that's over here, I would just multiply it by omega. And if I wanted to go from the first one all the way to the second one over here, I would multiply it by omega squared. And if I wanted to go to the third, the fourth, the fifth one, if I wanted to go all the way around here to the fifth one, I could multiply it by omega to the power of five. If I multiplied it by omega to the power of six, what do you think would happen? Not power of six, sorry. Yeah, power of six for this one. What do you think would happen if you multiplied it by omega to the power of six? Well, omega to the power of six would mean it would actually just land back where it is because in this particular polygon that we've got here, omega to the power of 6 is 1, okay? So it wouldn't actually do anything to it. So we can use this property to multiply by omega to make it move along the next vertex of the polygon. And I'm just going to break down what I've written here. If z1 is one root of the equation zn equals s, so for example here, this is going to be my z1. Let's actually just write that here. this is my z1. It's the root of this equation, which I know how to find the root of from earlier on. And if 1, omega, omega squared, etc. are the nth roots of unity of a different equation, 
then the roots of this one are going to be z1. I'm then going to take that root and I'm going to multiply it by omega. And that would give me this one here. I'm then going to multiply it by omega again, and it would give me the next one, etc. So for my particular one I would have here, I would have z1 omega cubed, z1 omega to the power of 4, and z1 omega to the power of 5. These are commas, not z1s. Okay, as well as they're starting to look kind of similar. So multiplying by omega, which is the first root of unity, moves it around to the next vertex on the polygon. Kind of crazy, but it does make sense with the things that we've been doing. I'm also going to just mention something now that will possibly be coming up later, and it came up in an exam paper. There is already a technique that we know how to move a coordinate along. If I knew that z1 was a coordinate, let's say that z1 had the coordinate x, y, I could actually express it as a vector x, y. And if I wanted to rotate something a particular number of degrees, can you think of a function or a thing that we know how to do that allows us to rotate things? The way that we can also rotate things is to do with linear transformations. We already know this from year one. If I wanted to rotate this theta degrees, I would rotate it by cos theta sine theta, and I think it's minus sine theta cos theta. And you would multiply it by x, y. This will actually do the same thing. One of them is doing it with complex numbers. The other one is rotating using a matrix, okay? That's rotating it theta degrees. And this might pop up later on because some questions you're gonna need to use matrices for this, especially in the exam question that they threw um, last year, I think it was. So I'm gonna do one question and then we're gonna do a question where the center of the shape they're talking about is actually not at the origin. So it doesn't sound like it's a complex number question. This just sounds like a regular question, but now you know these are gonna be linked to complex numbers. So it has the point root three, one is P, and it lies on one vertex of an equilateral triangle. This is the big clue that it's gonna to be to do with roots of unity. The center of the triangle is at the origins. So good, that's gonna make it nice and, e well, not nice and easy, but it's gonna make it easier than some of the other problems we have. First of all, we want to find the coordinates of the other vertices of the triangle, and then we're going to try and find the area. So I'm going to draw a quick sketch. It's not going to be very accurate, but I've got root 3, 1 is where one of the points is going to be. Now, if this is the center, looks like my next point is going to be somewhere over here, and my next point is possibly going to be either on the axis or it might be a bit off the axis. I'm not really sure. It's just a sketch. I may adapt this later on if I need to. Now, normally, if it was a roots of unity one, it would look a bit different, wouldn't it? It would normally have been starting somewhere over here. I don't know how long the lines would be here and here. So it looks like some things have happened. Looks like there's been a stretching and a rotation. So all I need to do, as we said on the previous page, is I'm just going to start off. I'll leave these here for a second. All I need to do is find out what Z1 is, which I already have because they've given it to me. And I need to find out what omega is, because then to find out the other coordinates, I can do z1 omega, I can do z1 omega squared. And if I did z1 omega cubed, hopefully this would bring me back to the coordinate p, which is root 3, 1. OK, so my complex number z1 is the coordinate, which is going to be root 3 plus i. And because we're talking about a triangle here, my omega is going to be e to the 2 pi over n. It's going to be a 3 in this case because we're doing an equilateral triangle, which is cubed. So omega is e to the 2 pi over 3 i. Now I'm going to put this in Cartesian form, which is going to be cos of 2 pi over 3 i. Whoops, not i. 2 pi over 3 plus i sine of 2 pi over 3. So cos of 2 pi over 3 is minus a half. And sine of 2 pi over 3 
is root 3 over 2. So it's root 3 over 2i. So if I take z1 and I multiply it by omega, it will take me from this position and it will rotate this complex number 2 pi over 3 so that it lands in its next coordinate. And if they multiply it by omega again, it will go from here and it will land here. And we've predicted that if we multiply it by omega again, it will end up at that last place. So the function of multiplying by omega is rotating around the uh, around the center of this uh, around this origin. Okay. Now I'm going to do most of this on a calculator because it's going to be a little bit easier. So let's work out what z1 omega is. That's going to be root 3 plus i multiplied by omega, which is minus the half plus root 3 over 2i. I'm going to try and set this up in a way that saves me some typing. So first of all, I'm going to type in root 3 plus i. And I'm going to store that in my calculator as my answer. And then I'm going to do the answer multiplied by omega, which is minus a half plus root 3 over 2 i. And it gives me minus root 3 plus i. So I get minus root 3 plus i. Now to find the next one, I'm actually just going to be taking this that I have here and I'm going to be multiplying it by omega again because this is already z1 omega. So z1 omega squared is this multiplied by omega. And I've got this all ready to go in my calculator. I can just press equals and it will multiply it by the same thing. It will take the answer and it will multiply it by that same omega. And when I press equals, did I press equals? I get minus 2i or minus i times 2. So I get minus 2i. And I'm going to just press it one more time. Because if I did do z1 omega cubed, we predicted it would bring us back to root 3, 1. So let's press equals again, and you do go back to root 3, 1. Let's just, just put this calculator onto the other side for a second. So when I keep pressing equals, you will see that we cycle through the three coordinates of the triangle, because multiplying by omega each time is just making it move 2 pi over 3 radians, or 120 degrees, around that um, centre of the, around the origin, okay? It's not quite the end of the question um, because it wanted them to be as coordinates. So uh, the coordinates of the other vertices are going to be uh, minus root 3, 1, and then it is going to be minus 2i, so that's going to be 0, minus 2. So in fact, when I drew this triangle at the beginning, really it should have been here, 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 and it actually should have been flat. So I'm going to draw that again because this diagram at the top isn't going to be helpful for any more. But for part B of the question, I'm going to need it. It says find the area of the triangle. So I am now at a position to be able to work out the area of the triangle. I'm going to draw a sketch with the coordinates. So one of them is at 0, minus 2. One of them is at root 3, 1, and the other one is at minus root 3, 1. And this is 1 here. So I want to find the area of this equilateral triangle. It doesn't look like an equilateral triangle, but it is. Well, to find the area, I'm going to do the base times the height divided by 2. So the area is going to be equal to a half times the base of this triangle. It's just going to be 2 root 3, because this is root 3 and this is root 3. So it is going to be 2 root 3. And the height of this triangle, well, it's going from 1 up here all the way down to minus 2. So that distance is 3. So that is going to be 3 root 3 units squared. OK, not easy, very conceptually difficult here. Um, if we really wanted to, we could have rotated these coordinates around 
to go from this first one to this next one, we knew that this was going to be 120 degrees rotation each time. So I'm going to really quickly show you this with a matrix multiplication. I know that the formula is cos theta sine theta minus sine theta cos theta. And you multiply that by the coordinate x, y. Now, theta in this case is 120 degrees. So if I was going to do this as a matrix calculation, I would do cos 120 minus sine 120, sine 120, cos 120, multiplied it by the x coordinate, which in the question originally was root 3, and the y coordinate, which is 1. So cos of 120, let me just quickly go back to degrees mode for a second. is a half minus a half and sine of 120 is root 3 over 2 so this would be like this now I'm going to just quickly work this out so if I multiply these together I would have minus root 3 over 2 minus root 3 over 2 for the x part and for the bottom part, I would have 3 over 2 minus a half, which gives me a coordinate minus root 3, 1. So I have the coordinate negative root 3, 1 that I have here. If I was then going to perform the next coordinate, I would have minus root 3 over 2. Whoops, no, I wouldn't. I would be using this matrix, so minus a half, minus root 3 over 2, root 3 over 2, minus a half, and this time I would perform the calculation on minus root 3, 1, which is going to give me root 3 over 2, minus root 3 over 2, and it's then going to give me minus 3 over 2, uh, minus a half, which gives me 0, minus 2. In other words, the coordinate is 0, minus 2, which is indeed the coordinate that we had here. So it's really cool to see how you can use literally like every kind of maths I think we've basically done before, like all in one place. We've got sums of series, we've got coordinates, we've got trigonometry, we've got imaginary numbers, we've got complex numbers, we've got matrices. We've got literally everything all on one kind of question. And when you look at the question to begin with, it feels like the kind of question that you could actually just work out by drawing it or by, it kind of even feels like a GCSE question in how simple the language of this question is. But the maths that's behind it is amazingly complex. And I just think it's a really, really cool question. And there's a few more like this in the exercise. So I'm just going to do one more video on this topic and then we're done. The next video is going to be where the centre of the shapes are not at the origin.